God, we want to pray right now that you would speak to us through your word. Your word has authority and power to overcome darkness, to break down evil. And Jesus, you have said that through your church that we would break down the gates of hell and set people free. Evil cannot stand against your truth and your love and your light. And help us, Lord, to be confident in that fact. Whether it's the little temptations that we give into or perhaps big battles with evil itself. Remind us, Lord Jesus, that you who resides within us is greater than the one who is in the world. Let us not be afraid of evil, and especially, God, let us not be afraid of standing against it. Amen. Lord God, help us to be courageous and bold. May your Holy Spirit's anointing rest on my friend and Pastor Jeff as he preaches your word today. And Lord, may we be challenged and inspired, exhorted and convicted of the authority that is ours and yours because you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you have already defeated the darkness. And now, God, help us to listen and act upon what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. With that, the children can go on to children's worship. Who are they following? Connie? Okay, so wait for Connie to get to the back. And Pastor Jeff, come up here. Morning. And um, hey, I'm... Uh, welcome back, girl. Bless, bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you. And... <laughs> I, I apologize if I uh, over gave too much attention to the fact that you had a beautiful tie on that you took off. It's okay. I, I just kind of looked around and thought it was the right thing to do. <clears throat> oh, I don't know. Hey, I, I just want you to know, this is a man of God who's a brother in Christ, and I count him as a special friend. So treat him well. <laughs> they, they have. Thank you. Thank you. Hard to live up to these kind of things. But, uh, hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. You know, some of us are getting to be friends around here, aren't we? I mean, you, at least you make me feel like I'm a friend. It's just kind of taking stock. That's what pastors do, right? You know, we sort of count sheep. <laughs> I want to see if everybody's here. Mm. Well, you can take a nap if you need to. That's okay. I had a, one of my mentor pastors told me, he said, don't worry about those guys that drop off on you during the message. It's not really your fault. I said, really? How do you figure that? Yeah. Convince me. He said, well, think about it. Some of these guys work outside in the elements all week, and they're, you know, they work with their hands. They work with their brains. They're intense. They're focused, and then they come in here, and this is the first time in a week that they've got up early, got to sleep in a little bit, got to take a nice hot shower, came and sat in these comfortably padded chairs. He said, they're just going to, they're going to leave you for a few minutes. Don't worry about it. He says, give them 120 seconds, they'll be back, and you'll see them. They'll go like that, and they'll shake, and he said, their blood will start in again, and it's kind of the adrenaline pumps, they'll be with you for the rest of the service. I said, oh, well, that's encouraging. I mean, we could at least convince ourselves with something like that rather than I put them to sleep again. <clears throat> if I pull on this, will it go up? Or will I, do I have to undo that little knob down there? Oh, that's better. It's, you know, it's, you can't see the knees knocking behind that. That's good. Hey, you want to jump into Mark chapter 1 and... We'll take on this passage that Pastor Bill has asked us to cover this morning. Um, I brought my own clock this time. I, I always said it 10 minutes slow. <laughs> Just in case. Mark chapter 1. 
Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he, notice the capital H, do you know that about your Bible, that when you get those capitals, it's talking about God, right? Okay. He entered the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine or teaching is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout the region all around Galilee. We just came out of come follow me, right, in Mark. But commentators will tell us that even though we only went one verse in the gospel of Mark, the immediacy of calling the four guys to follow him, the four fishermen to come follow him, they didn't just turn around right then and go into the synagogue. There are a lot of other things happened between the time those guys were called and the time this situation occurred. So there's a gap in time here. I don't know if that's important to you or me, but it wasn't like these guys were just brushing the sand off their feet to walk into the synagogue. And by the way, a synagogue is any place where people would gather other than the temple in Jerusalem, right? Where there were at least 10 men that would make up a synagogue. The word synagogue means to be, in fact, I think I have it defined here somewhere. It, uh, it just simply means to go with synagogue to go with that is a group of people who are going somewhere together gathering together where there was worship where there was prayer where there was the word and where there's some rabbi was going to give a discourse from that word and Jesus and these guys come to the synagogue the gathering of those men in Capernaum and it says when he comes in he immediately begins to teach um, there are those who would say that this might not have been the first week the first Sabbath that he was there, but that had he, had he had already been teaching there somewhat before. So in this moment when he comes in, they know that it's okay for him to take the scroll and begin to get into the word, as it were, and give a discourse from the word, and that it was some, of some length. Because Jesus knew how to tailor his message to his people, right? Probably way better than me. Probably a little better than Bill but way better than me. <laughs> and he taught with authority. This authority that Jesus was teaching with, see the scribes were learned men. He said way, way beyond the scribes because the scribes were learned men who knew the word, who knew the law, and they would take what other rabbis had said and sort of regurgitate it and they would compile teachings from others and then give that to the people. They were just giving out what they had learned. Maybe they hadn't even learned it themselves. I think we as preachers do that from time to time. We try and gather some important or some relevant facts we can share with you about the content of the word of God, but I didn't know it myself. I learned it from some commentator. I learned it from somebody who had actually been there, but I've not been there. Now your pastor's been there to these places. I mean, I, when we were sharing before church, I thought, man, when he starts preaching now, it's going to be different. I mean, it was good before, but it's going to be even better because those things are in his mind now, those places where Jesus actually walked, where he taught. I know some of you saw the Facebook post when they were selfie in front of the Sea of Galilee. I don't know if you saw what I commented. I said, be careful walking in the footsteps of Jesus there. 
Think about that. <coughs> sea of Galilee, walking on the water. I had to explain it. <laughs> I'm not doing very well, am I? This word authority, when they say he teaches as one who has authorities different than the scribes, the word is exousia, literally means to be out. It's delegated authority. To be out means if I were the person who was in charge and I sent Russ to go in my name and speak on my behalf, he would be the one that was out, to be out. They're saying Jesus speaks like one who is out, who has been sent out. He speaks like one with authority from somewhere else. He's not giving us a lesson from the rabbis and the other scribes and the conversations we had in the back room. He's teaching like he knows what he's doing. He has authority from somewhere that these scribes don't have. They recognized that this was God <coughs> speaking directly to them. Authority in himself, authority not derived from people, authority given to him by his father. They recognized Jesus' authority. This man with the unclean spirit, we could probably spend some time there, but, you know, unclean, do you know what that means? Unclean. <laughs> right? Not, not clean. <laughs> not good. When your kids are unclean, it's not good. You got to throw them in the tub. You got to clean them up. An unclean spirit. The spirit was in the man in the sense that this incorporeal being entered into the man's body, took up residence inside of him, and controlled him from within. Now, there's a debate, of course, that we can continue if we'd like. I'm going to have it shortly with myself in front of you that can a person be possessed or are they just oppressed? And we'll get to it. Okay, but this guy is possessed. He has an unclean spirit, a demon, inside of him that is directing traffic from inside of him. Yes. He is not always in control of himself. There are plenty of other passages in the New Testament about the man that brings his kid and says he's always throwing himself down. He throws himself in the fire. He foams at the mouth. I mean, all kinds of crazy things are happening here. Help us. And with a word, Jesus does for that young man the same thing he does here. The unclean spirit starts to yell right in the synagogue, right in the gathering. What have we to do with you, Jesus? That's what we get in the English. The real translation would be more like, you know that you and we have nothing in common. What have we to do with you? We are not like you. You are not like us. There's no reason for us to be together in this moment. What have we to do with you, Jesus? Nothing is the answer. We're not on the same page. But we know who you are. And they begin to announce to us, and the first point of, of my message that I would really like to make is that we, under, we need to see from this that there is a spiritual kingdom that we're living inside of right now. If you close your eyes and, and make the physical realm disappear for a few minutes, there is a spiritual dimension that's happening around you all the time, 24-7. It's a spiritual life you're living. There is a spirit kingdom, the kingdom of God. And Jesus, as he begins to preach here in Capernaum, is saying the kingdom of God is among you. In other words, where the king is, that's where the kingdom is. And I am the king, and it is my kingdom, Jesus is saying. And this announcement from this unclean spirit is like, well, we know who you are, holy one of God. You know, I don't think they were saying, yea, Jesus. We know who you are. It's probably slurred and malicious. We know who you are, you holy son of God. And Jesus isn't ready for that to be announced yet publicly. And so he just says, Giate. Here's the translation for be quiet. I mean, what does it say here in the scripture, really? Yeah, be quiet. 
And, and we grew up in our house, we didn't use the SH word. Right? We didn't. And one of the kids would run in, they said the SH word, they said the SH word. We'd freak out, like, no, oh, where did they learn that? What they meant was, we don't say shut up. You weren't thinking anything other than that, were you? <laughs> really? You were with me on that, right? <laughs> but if we drag this be quiet all the way down through Greek and Hebrew and scale it back, it just comes down to shut up. And it's not like the girls say today. Oh, shut up. <laughs> oh, shut up. It's not like that, okay? <laughs> I got the girls on that one. That was good. That just kind of, that must have been anointed right there. Shut up. Interesting, the word when Jesus, it says, Jesus rebuked the spirit. There are two different words in the original language used for rebuke. And again, this isn't stuff I know. This is stuff I just learned. I'm not a Greek expert in any way. I just love to read it and figure it out. One rebukes a person to tell them to repent knowing that they won't. It does, it's a rebuking that doesn't lead them to change. It's just a rebuke like Jesus said, shut up. Stop it. Why? Because demons, the devil, and this whole kingdom of his is not going to repent. It's not going to come to salvation. And so that's the rebuke word that Jesus used. And I think, I, I agree with the writer I learned this from. He said, isn't it amazing that under the anointing, how those who were writing the gospel message and giving us the scriptures used specific words as they were writing down what the Holy Spirit was leading them to tell us for today. He used a specific word that said, he rebuked them, but not to the point where they would repent. The other word, rebuke, would be one that might come to you and I. When the message of, of the gospel comes to us, it says, repent. Repent of your sin and come. And there's a change of heart from it. Jesus didn't use that. He just used the one that said, under my authority, you quit talking right now. And under that same authority, come out of it. And of course, the demon throws a little fit, throws the guy down, convulses a bit. The word there in the, is like having your stomach turned up, upside down and inside out, convulsed him, and then came out. And the man was free. Isn't that cool? That's cool. He's free. What, think of that, being delivered from that kind of inner torment, from having something else directing traffic on your heart and mind every day, and then all of a sudden being free. I mean, you're going to smell things you never smelled. You're going to see things you never saw before. I remember when I came to Christ, I mean, it's like colors were different, weren't they? It's like, wow, I'd never noticed the sky that blue. I mean, we have a blue sky, but that's really blue. And oh, smell that. Oh, my goodness. You know? And they were all so amazed. They said they were just, aren't you, look how fast I'm going through these pages. Those are just phony pages, actually. I, lo I load them in so it looks like I'm making progress. See, see if, oh, I have another one here. I can get rid of that. Yeah. Okay, we're just down to one. So we might get out of here before lunch. They were amazed. They said that they were conversing among themselves. I almost see it like in a life group where the, the dimension or the, the number of people was probably small enough to where they could look at each other and quiz each other and go, what is going on here? Is this a new doctrine? Is this a new teaching? The scribes never covered this before. We've not seen this kind of authority. Is there something new breaking out on the scene? They were inquisitive, but it also meant that they were confused. The way it's written down for us is that they did not understand, and so they began to dialogue with each other. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And they weren't coming up with the answer. But faith was happening. I mean, it wasn't hard to go one and one makes two. 
Because if we fast forward into the next few passages, which we're not going to cover, after this is over, they go back to Peter's house. Jesus heals his mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law. She serves him dinner. The sun goes down. When was Jesus preaching? On the Sabbath, right? When did the Pharisees rebuke people for healing? When did they rebuke Jesus for healing people? On the Sabbath. Come on, there's six days a week to do that healing stuff. Don't do it on the Sabbath. Pharisees, self-righteous, all that. They would attack the very Son of God for healing people on the Sabbath. Well, the people who knew that waited for the sun to go down. Look at verse 32. It says, that evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Why? Because the Sabbath was over. The sun was down. It's okay to bring them now. It's one of the other six days. And Jesus spent the evening dispossessing, casting out demons and healing people. And his ministry was underway in Capernaum. Amazing. Now, in the next few minutes, I have five quick points that I want to give you. They're hidden somewhere inside of 25 other points. But I'm sure you'll find them. But the first one is this simple. Jesus comes, and as in the other gospel, it says, he came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what John the Baptist was preaching, right? Repent, have a change of heart, metaneo, have a change of mind, the kingdom of God is here now. And you and I live in that kingdom. If we have given our hearts to Christ, we are inside that kingdom. And that kingdom is not geographic, right? You experienced the kingdom in Israel. You uh, had us pray for those Palestinian uh, Christians, right? Because they are in the kingdom of God. They are under his rule. Where the king is in charge, there is the kingdom. And where Jesus is living in you, wherever you go... There's the kingdom. Jesus came on the scene to say there is a spiritual dimension that is occurring around us all the time. And it is active and it is alive and it doesn't rest. It doesn't sleep. Sometimes we're fooled in our regular worldly movement and we think that it's just all natural materialistic and it's going to be just the same every day. But believe me, there is an enemy of your soul. His name is Satan. And he has brought with him a horde of demons to afflict anyone who calls on the name of Jesus. And he is no respecter of persons. John 10, 10, Jesus told us that the thief, who is the enemy, Satan, only shows up if there's one of three choices involved. He only comes on the scene to kill, to steal, and to destroy. How could you be a friend of Satan if his whole element of activity is to kill you, steal from you, or destroy what you have? Now, I've been around it enough to see him take the life of an elderly person in one moment and then take a baby in the next. And to get involved in a car accident and wipe out a family like that. Does he even take a breath? Does it even bother him? No. He is out to kill anything that is made in the image of God. And that's you and I. Jesus came to demonstrate publicly in this moment that his authority was above all of that. Matthew 28, 18. Have you read it recently? I think it's part of our, our uh, course here as we're talking about discipleship and following Jesus. You know it well. I should have just quoted it, but... 2818 Matthew, we call it the Great Commission. Don't get lost in the title and oh yeah, I know all about that. Listen to this. First sentence. As Jesus speaks, he says, all authority has been given to me. We sang it. Thank you. I don't need to preach. It's all in the, in the worship. The message was there. All Authority is given. All exousia. In his case, all the four Greek words belong to him. Energeo, uh, dunamis, all the power, everything is in Jesus. But here he says to us, his disciples, and to those present in the moment, all authority is mine. 
So if an unclean spirit shows up, should I be afraid? No. Why? Because he lives in me. These dimensions are always under his authority. The problem that we experience still today, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. How many is that talking about in here? Has he made you alive? When he came to give you life anew and you were born again, was there a difference? You were, you were the walking dead. I don't know anything about the TV program, so I don't know what that means. I don't, know, I don't need to relate to that. But we were walking around in a physical body with a soul that was at work, mind, will, and emotions, but the spirit side of us was dead in sin and trespass against God. And it says, now he came, he came and made you alive. Now you're born again. You're in the spirit kingdom. You're, you're working with it. The problem is if a person is still dead in trespasses of sin, they are still available to be a repository for demon, a demon possession. Can a person be possessed? The answer is yes. It's demonstrated here. Jesus cast him out from being within. Spiritually dead men and women are still potential repositories for demons. However, for you and I, this is point number two, being born again changes everything. <laughs> being born again. Jesus said, John chapter 3, 3 and 5, he said, in, he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, unless you are born again, you can't even see the kingdom. Have you ever talked to somebody who was, didn't know Jesus yet? And you try and explain something spiritual to them and they're looking at you like the proverbial deer in the headlights thing, like, um, okay, what? and they're not getting it. And, but you have it. So you think they should understand it because you're explaining it. And as you explain it, and you know you explained it really well, and they're still staring at you like, okay. They can't see the kingdom. It's not possible yet for them. That's why you don't want to take, you know, when Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine, you don't want to talk about deep theological topics with people who don't know Christ. They can't see it. The first thing they need to know is Jesus loves you. He knows you. He died for you. Your sins are separating you from him. Why don't you come to him right now? And then the lights will come on for you and we can talk about this other stuff. Where we get tripped up in leading people to Christ is getting lost in the conversations they want to have about everything else except their salvation. I mean, let's not waste our breath. I say, that's a great question you have about the last days and how many angels can stand on the head of a pen. <laughs> but before I answer that, could I ask you a different question? Are you saved? Have you known him personally? Have you given your heart over to Jesus yet? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? Are you at one with him yet? Well, no, I'm not. Well, then it doesn't matter how many angels can stand on the head of a pen or whether you can stuff the universe in a milk carton. Have you been asked these? I've been asked these questions. <coughs> like, wow, big milk carton. But lead them to Christ. Jesus said, you can't see the kingdom. And in verse five, he told Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom unless you're born again. But if you're born again, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 that you're born of incorruptible seed. Excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. You and I have been born again of incorruptible seed. It means it's a seed that doesn't perish. Seeds come and go in the natural. They plant, they grow up, it's over. This seed coming from God himself planted in you never dies. You've been born again by a living seed. Even Jesus himself is bringing you life on a daily basis and it will never quit. Amen. Never. So for me, remember when, when Jesus said, any, you know, Revelation, was it 319? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Amen, here's my voice, what? Opens the door. He's gonna come in. Jesus said, hey, if you open a, open a method for us, the Father and I will come and take our, our abode inside of you. 
Jesus said to his disciples, Luke 14, 40, or 24, 49, I'm going to mix it up here a little bit. He said, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise which I'm going to send, right? And then in Acts 1, 8, he said, you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That is the promise to be infilled with his Holy Spirit, to empower us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth, right? He's going to indwell us. So when I'm born again and then I become indwelled by his Holy Spirit, for me, this hangs out the sign that says no vacancy. We have lots of those around in our mountains, don't we? On those big weekends. No vacancy. We sell them all out. No vacancy. What does that mean? That means that the demon can't stop by and take up residency in you. So the question of can a believer be possessed by an unclean spirit? My belief is no. But there's another word in the Bible that says we can be oppressed. And this is the word philipsis. And it's like if I could take all of my fake notes here, and if I had a stack this high, there would still be air between the pages, wouldn't there? A little bit. But if I took that stack of papers and I put both hands and leaned on it, I could press it flat, right? Flatter. I could make it more dense. What am I doing? I'm just dispelling all the air that's between the pages. I'm pressing the air out of it. Philipsis. Oppression. When the enemy comes to a believer, he loves to just come and start in slowly, put his hand on you, and begin to just press the air out of you. To squeeze the life out of you. Can you be possessed? No, but you can be oppressed. But if you recognize it, it won't last for long. Don't be afraid of the devil. He's a loser. He believes so much of a lie that he actually believes he's going to win in the end. Can you believe that? I mean, he is so deceived. He has deceived himself. Can I skip ahead in my notes? Isaiah chapter 14. Maybe you've read this. This is a description of Satan. Isaiah 14. You've heard about it if you haven't read it. Verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This was his downfall, right? Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Now here's our part. Here's where we come in. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Is this the one that shook kingdoms? Who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Is this the thing? What's it tell? This tells me that if you and I could get a glimpse of what we're fighting invisibly, if we could get a physical glimpse of this demon, this devil, this Satan, we're going to have this response at some point. We're going to walk by and go, that's it? That's what I was afraid of? Are you kidding me? That's nothing. This is a true description of Satan and his demonic hordes. They are no match for the Jesus that lives in you if you are born again. And if you are born again, you will see the kingdom of God and you will enter into living inside the kingdom of God where his rule is in charge. The Bible admonishes us once we come into that kingdom. In Galatians 5, 1, Paul writes, Stand fast, therefore, in your liberty. Maintain your liberty. When you feel the oppressive moments come, rebuke him just like Jesus did. But not in your name. Do it in his name. Right? Acts chapter 16, we've got Paul and in Silas. They're in Philippi. They've already gone out by the riverside. They've got Lydia, and they're in a prayer meeting, and people are getting saved and baptized. And then they're walking around town, and the little girls follow them around all the time going, these are the men of God. These are the announcers of the kingdom. And says Paul finally one day just gets a little irritated. He turns around and he says, come out of her in the name of Jesus, not in the name of Paul. Come out of her in the name of Jesus. And the girl is set free. The guys lose their living. They go to jail. 
They get the midnight praise session. The jail rocks. Everybody's out. The flipping jailer gets saved. And we got a house church. That's Acts chapter 16. That's awesome stuff. But what's it hinge on? Announcing the kingdom. Taking the kingdom wherever we go. And not being afraid of demonic activity. Amen. Knowing it's there. And when you see it, just calm it down. Tell it to stop. I'm not going to allow the thalipsis to happen to me anymore. Let him push the air out of my life. I'm going to draw in the life of Jesus. I've been born again. And you've been born again. It makes a difference. A word of caution. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, your activity is more like Luke chapter 11, verse 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. This is what I call the new leaf syndrome. I just decide I'm a good person. I don't need Jesus. I'm having a little problem with this thing that irritates me from time to time. I don't know what it is, but by golly, I'm going to take care of it. I'm just going to have a New Year's resolution. I'm going to have a new leaf. I'm just going to turn over a new leaf. I'm not going to do that anymore. And for the moment, he dispossesses that demonic influence in his life. But the Bible says these demons want to indwell something. They want to live in a body of some kind. And so it goes out and wanders around in dry places, doesn't have any place to rest. So it says, I'll go back and check out the old apartment. Gets back, hey, it's all cleaned and swept. The new leaf syndrome has taken effect. The guy's cleaned his life up. Look at that. Everything's spanking new. So, hey, boys, got a big apartment here. It's big enough for all of us. Let's all move in. And that guy's last state is worse than the beginning. You've probably known people like this. Maybe you didn't recognize it. They seem to just get gradually worse and worse and worse. Why? Because they still haven't surrendered to Jesus. They haven't found a way to be born again, and that's, a, that's our goal, is to lead them to that so that all of the freedom can come to them as well. But don't just, if you're here this morning and you have not invited Christ into your life, I mean, I'm, I'm be, I'd be impressed if you were here. <laughs> and for that reason, you should do it before you go home. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. You don't have guarantees about tomorrow. None of us do. I, I just want to always remind us of that. I, I love the rim drive this morning. It was clear on both sides. I mean, you could see from wherever to there. And it's like all the way from Barstow to wherever the other side of it was. You can't quite see Catalina. But you could see a long ways. It's beautiful. But I don't have any guarantee that I'm not going to miss a curve on the way home. And Peggy and I will take up residency permanently in heaven. She's probably a little scared of the drive now, but <laughs> if any of you want to keep her overnight, <laughs> it's like, I'm not riding with him. What is he thinking about? <laughs> but I have no guarantee. No guarantees. Today is the day I need to give my life to Jesus. However, if you're here and you decide not to, you know what? That's your choice. It's okay with me. But Jesus loves you so much. He doesn't want you to leave here without him today. But if you decide, well, I'll try it again this week on my own. Mind this passage of Scripture. Look it up for yourself, Luke 11, 24. Just go ahead and turn over your new leaf, and then two weeks from now, when it's worse, come back. And come to Jesus and let him deliver you from the influence of the other kingdom that does exist. Because the battle still goes on every day between these two kingdoms. It's a fight. It's a fight. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, just before this, he says, they're, they're mad at him for casting out demons in verse 14 of Luke 11. It was a mute one. When the demon had gone out, the mute spoke. What a day that must have been. Oh my goodness. To be able to, be able to speak. From not being able to speak to being able to speak. Just because it was blockaded by a demon. Some of them said, well, he casts out demons by Beelzebub the ruler of demons. Jesus said, a house divided against itself can't stand. Boys, think about it. So if I'm casting out 
uh, demons by Beelzebub, then who do your sons do it by? You know, they'll judge you. He said, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God, there it is again, is among you. And when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. He's talking about the devil. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. And he's saying, the stronger one is here. I am the stronger one. What does it say in John 4.4, 1 4, John 4.4? 4, 4? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The stronger one has arrived. He's now indwelling you. Remember my, one of my favorite phrases, right? The Jesus in me greets the Jesus in you. It's not about us. It's about who's inside. Amen? I mean, Jesus makes us look better. <laughs> That's something else I noticed after I got saved. I said, well, I'm just better looking than I used to be. <laughs> And I used to be really good looking. That's a joke, of course. <laughs> For us, the battle mostly is in here. Second Corinthians chapter 10, right, says that we live in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. We have to bring down every high thought that exalts itself against Christ. We have to bring down... Casting, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They cast down imaginations that exalt themselves against God. A lot of the battles in here. The enemy throws fiery darts, right? We're supposed to quench them with the shield of faith. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, the, sh the whole armor of God. Part of that is the shield of faith quenching the fiery darts of the wicked one. But he is throwing them all the time, right? Sometimes they stick in our head and those thoughts... You have those thoughts, don't you? Thoughts that are negative, thoughts are, that are against you, thoughts that are against your faith. They enter in, and what we need to do is say, that's not mine. That's not mine. I wouldn't think that way. But it's there. So he gives us spiritual armor and spiritual warfare capability that is above the natural. It's the in the name of Jesus, spiritual we just yank that thing out. Say, that is not mine. You go back to the pit where you belong. I, in fact, let me just put you at the foot of the cross where you belong. Just stay there. No longer mine. In the name of Jesus, who loved me and gave his life for me. His blood is stronger than you. His name is greater than you. Demon, go. Right now, get out of my house. Get out of my car. Get out of my head. Am I bridging on, have I moved across the Baptist line here? Am I getting Pentecostal? I'm sorry. Not really, not really sorry. It's a, it's a real kingdom we're dealing with here, and it's a spiritual battle, and we have to win it. In the Revelation, we sang it up here. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11 said, there is an accuser of the brothers, but he's cast down. The accuser of the brethren is cast down. How? What did we sing? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. How did Jesus defeat Satan in the very beginning? In the temptation, in the wilderness. It is written. It is written. It is written. By the word of God. By our testimony. By our agreement with this book. By our agreement with the living Christ. By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and speaking by his blood and by his word and by our agreement with his testimony, the accuser of the brothers is cast Amen. down. Amen. First John 3, 8 says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. First John 3, 8. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. I heard one man preach this once. I've never been able to forget it because he was graphic. I won't be. But he said the definition comes down to this. It literally means he was skinned alive. Now, if you know anything about that, this was not an uncommon practice hundreds of years ago. 
still practice today, the skinning a person while they're still alive, slowly taking off the outer layers. I mean, one wrong move, they just explode. There's nothing to hold them in anymore. So a sneeze, they're gone. There's no ability to live against any elements at all anymore. And Jesus came to skin the devil alive means he is literally powerless to move against us and to exert an effort against us that we cannot defend ourselves from. One wrong move, self explodes. Jesus skinned him alive. That's graphic. But it means he came to destroy his ability to work against you successfully. Jesus demonstrated it in our passage. Why is this victory ours? I, don't, I didn't announce my points. I don't do that very well. I'm sure you're aware of that by now. I know they're there. You never find them. I'm going to give you a copy. Maybe you could figure it out. But <laughs> Jesus demonstrates the kingdoms that are at work. Being born again changes everything. Third, the battle continues between the opposing kingdoms. Fourth, this is our victory, that greater is he that's in you, in you than he that's in the world. And the fifth one is we have to answer the question, why is this victory ours? Why? Here's some simple answers. Because it's his authority, not mine. He's the creator of everything. He is over it all. All authority, Jesus said, is mine. On, in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you get to go and do things in my name. Don't do them in your own strength. We saw that too, the seven sons of Sceva. We didn't spend any time there, but if you read the Bible, you know, it says, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. It's like, well, we don't really know him, but we heard about him, so let's try that. And it says that that demon jumped on those guys and stripped them, and they went off running. Why? Because they were not in the authority of Jesus' name as you are. You do have authority. Why? It's his authority. He's delegated it to you just like the Father delegated it to him. He said, I'm going to go away and greater things than I've done, you will do too in my name. John 14, 14. Why do we have this victory? It's because of his blood. He's the redeemer. He purchased us back. He spent his life to put this in place. He gave it all. He made the purchase. He spent his blood. That's why the victory is ours. We don't deserve it. Amen? Amen. We didn't do anything for it. He gives it to us. Just like he took action when we couldn't. Why is this our victory? Because he took action when I couldn't. He humbled himself. But Philippians chapter 2 says he is now exalted. He humbled himself. And the Father decided, I will exalt him. Give him a name that's above every name. That at that name, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that he is Lord. Why is this victory ours? Because of his righteousness, which he imputes to us. You know, when I stand before God, and every time I do, I mean every time I get confronted with being with the Father, I have to realize that he only looks at me through his son. It's the only way he would look at me is through the righteousness of his son that he has given to me because my Bible and your Bible says that all my righteousness is like filthy rags. I don't have anything to offer. And I come to him and I say, Lord, it's by, again, by your grace that I come. I can only stand here because you said I could. I'm only here because you've imputed to me, given me freely the righteousness that your son has, and therefore you see me as holy and clean and pure before you. And so I will stand in that. I won't deny what you've done for me. I won't say I'm not deserving. I will say that I understand I'm not deserving, but I will stand in it nonetheless and proclaim with you that I am holy, that I am righteous, and that I am accepted in the beloved, and that I do have a life now that I didn't used to have. Why is this victory mine? Because he gave it to me by his grace. I can't do it without his grace. And this victory is mine and yours because in this process of becoming a disciple, he says, come follow me. Then we learn of him. And then eventually he says, now you go. And he commissions us as his people to go into all the world and make disciples wherever we're going. I'll be with you to the very end. We're going to do this 
together. I'm not sending you out on your own. You're going to go out in my strength, under my covering, with my name, with my authority. And even the demons tremble that you're on the scene. You're something else, aren't you? You really are something in Jesus. You're not much without him. Amen? Amen. Disagree. We're nothing without him. Everybody take a deep breath as I drop this last page. (laughs) We must be done. This is a great message. I don't say it because I gave it. I'm just, it's a great message for me to study. It's a great message for me to hear. I want to win with Jesus. I want to be a faithful disciple. I want to be one who goes into all the world and announces the kingdom is present because I'm there. I just think it's great. I mean, why not have the presence of God come down in the middle of McDonald's? Why not? Huh? Carl Jr., Del Taco, wherever you go. Because you walked in. We might not have people feel the presence of God because you showed up. You think about yourself in those terms? You really should. You're a child of God. You're different than the world. You're living inside a kingdom that doesn't dwell in some places, but when you walk in, ooh, something changed. Say, so, yeah, Jesus is here. How do I know Jesus is here? I brought him with me. <laughs> Amen. That's why, that's why I know he always comes to church. Because he comes with you. Amen. Am I supposed to close in prayer? Are we going to sing or what do we do next? Sorry. May I pray? And then you guys can come. Feel free. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for the very giant gift of your son. Thank you that you did love us so much that you gave him to us. That he might not condemn us, but save us from our sin. To bring us back into relationship with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for being responsive to the Father and answering the call to come and spend your life on my behalf and the behalf of my friends here today. Lord Jesus, I pray that every one of us in this building will go home with you, living in our heart as Lord and Savior. Let me ask you right now, I mentioned this earlier, if you're here, you've not given your heart to Christ, you've not said to him, I am a sinner, and my sin is against you and you only, I would like to give you this opportunity right now to pray with me a simple prayer. Let me just get you started this morning. Just in your heart of hearts, in the very center of the being that you are right now, say this to him, Lord Jesus, I get it. You died for me. There's more about this than just going to church. You're alive. You're alive from the dead. You want to live in me, and I've resisted you long enough. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. Forgive my sin. Wipe out the record of all the wrongs I've done against you. And as your word says, give me the gift of eternal life. I want to live for you. I want to live by you. I want you to live inside of me and bring me freedom from the oppressions that I've experienced in this life. Give me a brand new day. and Jesus, I will follow you in all my ways forever. Amen. Lord, take them at their word this morning. Bring them into your family. Embrace them, Father, with your love, and I pray that you'll give them friends here in this house that will walk the walk with them all the way through to the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we move on... um...